Robert Scott Bell, the power to heal is yours, baby. Welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where people are right now. I, I should be out working out, but I'm going to be working out with you right now from a distance of via StreamYard. How are you doing, Laban? Mate, I'm... Uh, do you know what? Normally I would say something like I'm, I'm so blessed that if no. I was any more blessed, I'd be in Boston bronzed and erected in the town square somewhere. But uh, this will be part of this topic of today. Yeah. In, in conjunction to the power to heal is yours. Yeah. But the real answer is I'm a bit pissed off. Yeah, because you're, not, pi- cause you're not here with me hanging out. That is the primary. <laughs> that is the primary reason, and we're not there for your beautiful bride's birthday. Hey, big shout out to exactly. I'm pissed Nancy too. <laughs> and that we're not there to cook you dinner. But mm. uh, as part of the, there's this conversation piece because this, this series is a separate series to the main podcast series. And this has been like a commitment to go live for, uh, every day, every weekday at least for the next 30 days. And I've been really enjoying, I've been doing some solo monologuing stuff, which is no, I know what you, you love to do as well, Rob. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got some other guests coming on later in the week and weeks after. But the, the reason, the reason for such a non-excited response would be I've been let down by a number of people. Oh. And, uh, and financially and uh some some not financially but mainly financially i got myself in a bit of a situation and and i'm pissed i don't know whether i'm pissed at myself sure. or i'm pissed at myself and some of them for allowing this to happen and i and i wanted to explore this with you and kind of my point was i can kind of see why some people go down the path of getting jack of it all and start ripping people off. Mm. I can see, I can see how that might happen. And I was like, "Holy God!" Like I'm, I'm going to the dark side here. And I was curious to know before we even get into the rest of the stuff today, what are you, what are your thoughts on how to manage this kind of scenario, being let down by people repeatedly? Well, I think we're working with a, a, a system that almost encourages and rewards that kind of behavior. You know, if you think about the, the monetary system, when we talk about uh, money, utilizing it, getting it, borrowing it, giving it, taking it, the entire system is rigged against honesty and integrity because the, the monetary system is, is based on deception and lies, at least the one we're using globally right now. Uh, we talk about in the United States of America, something called the Federal Reserve System, and it's money that has no, no true backing. It, it, it doesn't represent anything other than the, what they talk about on the thing, full faith and credit, that kind of concept. And of course, the faith is not in God, although you'll see in God we trust on some of the coins. And I, I, I just ironically point out that that's there's nothing in the money, so you better put your faith in God. But at the same time, uh, when you're working with a, a deceptive system, the banking system, uh, it kind of lends itself to, hey, how do people really profit in the system? They have to cheat and lie and steal to get ahead, to stay ahead, to keep ahead, because every time they utilize that money, it's worth less and less and less. So they feel like it can never get ahead. And those that do are usually connected to somebody or something like in government. Uh, and they get to touch the money first when it has some value. And then as it you know, kind of sits out there and, and, and diminishes, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I'm losing, I'm losing. So you always gotta work to get ahead. So the system encourages cheating because the system itself cheats people out of the, the value that they think they're working for, earning, or holding on to. And I know this is a weird, because it's not specific to the individuals that are cheating you or di- disappointing you, but the, the entire system is set up to never allow you to fully get ahead unless you're in the club, as George Carlin said. It's a big club and you ain't in it. And you don't want to be in it either because it's actually filled with misery. And so we get into this materialistic aspect of uh, the culture of, we got to get more stuff. We got to get more paper. We got to get more digits now, digitized and, and, and done artificially. So you know, uh, from hanging out with my son, how we look at how do we work with something that has tangible uh, value? You know, if you ever got paid in gold or silver, like I've ta- taught my kids to do, and I've done for almost thirty years now, you actually are being paid in something that you feel like that actually is what it is, and tomorrow it still be it still be what it is. And, and therefore it lends itself to, you know, I've, I've exchanged something of value for something of value. Whereas you work hard and you do great work and you help people and they pay you in not something of value, but they pay you in something that is evidence of debt. 
evidence of debt. The Federal Reserve note, the dollar is evidence of debt, as are all fiat currencies. They are all evidence of debt. So you're exchanging a debt that you owe somebody or somebody owes you with more debt. And it's not spiritually fulfilling. We get to that point where we get beyond economics and recognize the spirit of exchange. You gave something of value. You gave your heart, your time, your soul, your commitment, your your, your energy, your your knowledge, your experience. And then they give you, here's this stuff, digits in a, in a, in a bank account or paper. And you're like, they paid me with debt? Well, you might not know that consciously because many people don't study the monetary system like I have for a long time, but yet it's not fulfilling. And so it, it's always like, well, maybe if I can get more for less and I'll cheat somebody out of it, I'll feel more fulfilled. And it's a materialistic, uh, you know, uh, target that you can never fully fulfill. You know, it never fills the heart because it's not a heart based exchange. Uh, so you asked me a very deep question maybe not thinking that it would go this way, but that's ten, tending to where I think about it. And it doesn't address the individual's responsibility in terms of what they promised or what they committed to and didn't. But I'm just saying that the system that we're interacting with is fraught with that kind of deception because it's designed to be that way. No, I'm glad you went as deep as you did. I think people need to hear this. And it, and it makes a lot of sense to me, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, if, people, if people are feeling ripped off, you know, even if it's subconsciously, then they are way more likely to rip, try and rip other people off. Maybe that's the energy that's being created with this whole, you know, system that you're talking about. How, how do you mitigate this? Yeah. Well, I remember, uh, uh, was it a oh, paperweight on the, on the uh, desk of Ron Paul years ago? And, and it was, it was very telling. Um, it said, don't steal. The government hates competition. And it, it basically, it, it, you know, because the entire system is set up on theft, you know, they call it taxation, whereas in the Constitution of the United States, there's legitimate forms of taxation, including imposts, sex sizes, and tariffs. Uh, at the time of um, the progressive era from the late uh, 19th century through the 20th century, there was an emergence of something called Marxism and the Communist Manifesto, which included one of the key planks, a graduated income tax. Uh, which basically said, we own 100% of your efforts and we get to tell you how much you get to keep, which is the reverse of what people think. Well, I paid X percent. It's like, no, no, no. They said you could keep that other X percent. And, you you know, it, it's, a, it's again, a deceptive practice because it basically says we own you, we own your efforts, and therefore we, by the graces, the good graces that we have for you, and you just be should, should be happy that we don't take even more. Basically, we let you keep a certain percentage. So, you know, how do you mitigate living in a system that has enslaved you before you even begin? And, and, and for, for those that say, well, you got to pay taxes. It's like, well, look, there are lawful ways to do it without uh, claiming ownership over you because then you're chattel, you're, you're basically property of those who, ha who get to say, hey, you know what, this is how much it will let you keep, right? And, and so how do we mitigate that? We've got to go back into the, I guess, a very conscious uh investigation into how is it that we can interact with the world economically and recognize it is an energetic exchange. It is a spiritual uh, interaction ultimately. And these things are representative of that, you know, and then we're utilizing something that is so devoid of spirit and value that we think we're doing and we're engaged in, you know, lawful and righteous activity of, you know, means of exchange economically. But the once again, I come back to the uh, entirety of whatever the field is surrounded by an electrified fence that they try to constrain you and contain you in. And you're like, you're never fulfilled in that. And, and so I've, you know, just trying to encourage people to say, you know, what is it that you have a value that, uh, you know, you are giving to the world? And you want to be able to get and also be compensated for it. And then what form of compensation is actually honoring of that, which you are, you know, entering into a sacred relationship. I talk about that from a doctor patient perspective. It was always called a sacred, you know, doctor patient relationship. And that's destroyed by inter third party interveners. And the physician community is learning how devoid of a true exchange is happening because they have w welcomed in all of these entities, government, private combinations of the two to corrupt the sacred, let's say, exchange between someone who knows something, someone who's seeking something that you know to get them well, to help them, 
And yet they're not even participating in the exchange in terms of support financially or otherwise, because these third parties enter it. And, and even if we uh, make devoid the, the official government involvement in ex- insurance exchanges, we go, all right, what does the Federal Reserve have to do with all of this? For instance, what does the, the IMF and the World Bank have to do? with? They've intervened in all of the relationships that were normally, you know, of a voluntary nature. We would engage each other because it's like, you have something I want. I have something you want. Let's exchange it. Now in the barter system, it was more honest because if you had a cow, a pig, a chicken, or, you know, whatever it is, and somebody offered you do like you, you had something obviously of value that wasn't uh, partially stolen from you in the exchange, nothing like it was, it was full on integrity in that. And we have lost that system. So as I said, the entire system is corrupted from the word go third parties, again, artificial inductions of something called money that are not yours, that are evidences of debt. And, uh, you know, this, this is a, I didn't intend to go here today either, Laban, as far as the discussion, we didn't know. And we just can't hang out and talk about this stuff. But boy, this goes deep because we talk about the honesty and integrity of spiritual exchange in in freedom, in, in, in a voluntary action and say, what are we utilizing? And we are unconsciously utilizing stuff that never fulfills or distar- discharges the debt to one another that is, made voluntarily, not through, I want to enslave you. I want to capture you and make you my minion. You have to do everything I say because right, I own you. Basically that concept of, of a slave relationship versus a true voluntary, wonderful plus factor where you are both benefited and you feel better because you've interacted in, in a way. And yes, there are economics in exchange, but what are we utilizing that, that robs that beauty and that spiritual essence of that relationship? That's the bankers. You know, Jesus talked about the money changers. That's what we're still talking about today in various different ways. Again, I'm glad you went this heavy because <laughs> we really didn't come into this with any agenda. And, and mm-hmm. for, for folks who are listening to uh, Rob for the first time, you need to check him out. He's been in the game for 20 plus years. You can find him at the Robert Scott Bell Show.com. He broadcast six days a week, Rob. Yeah, robertscottbell.com, six days a week. We do five uh, two-hour-plus shows uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, Sundays we pre-record for our broadcast radio syndication show, which you know started in 1999, that show. And, uh, yeah, we have a, the AMAs are fun. I think you were a guest on one of our AMAs for our patron crowd. It was a, a, a great time. We just had another one last, last week. We do that once a month as well. And that's via Zoom. Everything else is done, you know, more broadcast. But we have live chat room during the show. People still can watch us on social media on the different platforms that we've not been banned on or we were and we're back. <laughs> so uh, but it's health and healing. But as we as you can see, we're talking about something that might be considered economics. But going to the energetic exchange of economics and what we use to exchange how that impacts that, again, I, I, I would say a sacred relationship. When you come into someone maybe you know and love or someone you just met and said, hey, I'd like to go into business with you. Or as you've talked about, Laban, I, I've had interactions with people. They made some promises and commitments and they, they, they didn't follow through on it. And I'm not saying it's all 100% because of the system itself, but the system itself lends itself to that kind of interaction. Moving outside of that, you find people in integrity that say, I understand the value of the exchange and I truly do appreciate you, and I want to enter and engage in this voluntarily. Uh, and then, you know, moving in, in terms of um, something of value for something of value versus something we perceive has value, but it's being, you know, it's game. We're game. The game, the system is game. And, you know, this was an interesting thing, too, about a comedian. Uh, what's, what's the guy's name from Ohio? He was on Saturday Night Live hosting. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle came on, yeah. And, and one of the things he said about Donald Trump uh, he's like trying to explain why do white people in Ohio like Donald Trump or people in Ohio like Donald Trump. They're saying he went back to uh, the debate with Hillary Clinton some years ago uh, where, uh, you know, Hillary said, you're not paying taxes, something like that. And, and Trump says, yeah, that's right. It's because I'm smart. And it was like, what? A shocker of a moment right on the stage. He says, because, you know, the system is rigged. It's, it, the system is, is, is just it's it's a system set, you know. Uh, basically to, I'm saying enslave you, but it's, it's a game system, a rigged system. And then they're all shocked. And then the, uh, the, the moderator says, well, Mr. Trump, how, how are you, you're claiming this? How do you, how do you know that it's, it's rigged? He says, because I'm in it, I use it. 
and I have for many years. And again, Chappelle says that was the most honest thing. And then Hillary and, and Obama go, oh, it's not rigged. It's not rigged. And, and he was pointing out that they were the liars in that equation. You know, he was honest about the system. The system is rigged. And if you want to get ahead in it, you have to participate in deceptive practices. And, you know, that's for me something that I saw so many decades ago that, you know, I came to the conclusion that I want to have as little to do with it as possible. And I, you know, I switched out and stopped using Federal Reserve notes as a primary means of exchange and went to gold and silver. And I felt it was a much more honest uh, system. Certainly, it made life more difficult for me to interact with the economic world that had you know, kind of fallen all over us, the veil of illusion that we all just kind of operated in. And when I woke up and saw it for the deception that it is, G. Edward Griffin wrote a book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, talked about, you know, the Federal Reserve. It's neither federal nor are there any reserves. It's a dishonest system. And so if we work within it, man, it is hard to stay pure. I'm not saying there aren't good people that use that system, but recognize if you really want to get ahead, the entirety of it is corrupt from underneath. You know, the belly is rotting, and yet we're trying to make our best way through it, not be impacted by it, not be corrupted by it. And it's a very difficult thing unless you're, you know, 24-7 in that spiritual consciousness. And even then, all right, even then. Yeah, it's a great point, Rob. And, and uh, you know, that, that staying in integrity, because I don't know whether, maybe it's just, you know, I've been in this entrepreneurial journey for like three years. Yeah. Really for the last 12 months has been where I've been able to generate an income for the first time. And it feels like more and more people are, are letting me down. And not just me, other people as well. It's like it's hardly anyone can be relied upon for their for their word anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what's the alternative? Like when you're engaging with these people, like do you hold a gun to their head? Like, <laughs> what, what is what? What's the alternative? How do you? And and what the last thing I wanted to do would be to generate a level of skepticism where I'm like tarring everyone with the same brush, right? Yeah. So do you, do you have any ideas about how to attract more high quality people? less mm. less low lower vibrational people oh man that, it, that's a as big a question as any that can be asked and 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 it takes um this is a you know function of time if i did a mathematical equation is it would be lovely if like you can switch on a dime and suddenly it all transforms yet there are residues associated with the kind of things that we've intended to do even you know with with you know well-meaning things we'd like to do uh, yet there are, uh, let's say, patterns of, of, of uh, energies out to the universe about what we'd like to achieve in terms of economics. You know, we want to be successful. And what does that mean? How do we define it? I mean, it really is getting down to defining our terms because the interpretation and misinterpretation is so very real and so almost, again, built into the system, the vagarities of, uh, uh, you know, what, what I want and what you want. We say the same words, but we mean completely different things. It's like, I think we got to come back to that, define our terms and really understand when a person says this, or if I say this word, what do you hear me saying? And what do you think it means? And, and, and that's, you know, a spiritual thing in terms of consciousness and communicating with God, you know, as far as the words we use and what do we mean by them versus, uh, perception, you know, and, and others, how they perceive it based on their experience. And so finding, um, those people of integrity as an ongoing, uh, let's say, uh, well, it's a skill, for instance, to be able to determine, you know, are these people uh, grounded in the same principles of what we perceive to be goodness and righteousness as, as I am intending to, to do? And there's such deception, subtle deception in all of that. Now, it can be from people's wounds and abuses in the past, and we don't see it, and they've found a way to cover it up, whether they're in one of the pathologies, you know, from socio- sociopaths to otherwise. But there are people that are very good at smoking us, you know, taking advantage of good people who are sincere and mean well. And that to some degree is a naivete on our part. Some degree it's a, we want to be able to trust people because we look to the people and we see the goodness in them. And, and I'd rather be there and, and be ripped off occasionally than just look cynically at everybody that they're automatically trying to rip me off. But I recognize I have to protect myself and my family in those interactions as well in those relationships. So for me, it's a spiritual practice. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, singing the sacred words of God like Hugh uh, and and kind of being open to the guidance that is beyond the mind because we can we can really get skilled with our, our mental acuity and abilities. 
yet still be deceived by someone who has just that one little angle that knows our vulnerability and, and plays it. And so for me, that hue is a sound and a, and, a, and a vibration that allows me to to step out of even my own ego and say, all right, what's really happening here? Give me the guidance, provide for me that which I cannot intellectually fully understand or or even even if I think I'm smart, that's also a trap. Uh, but to get me beyond the mind to be able to protect me from a, a relationship that would be more harmful than helpful. Although along the way, those harmful relationships I've had helped me ultimately to learn how to navigate what you're asking about. So it's an ongoing journey. And I don't know, as long as we're here, there'll always be a potential to deceive or be deceived. The question is, are we committed to our spiritual practices and the relationship with that which is beyond the mind to be able to navigate and not fall prey to those deceptions that are very subtle uh, even if we're skilled and experienced. And uh, the more I reflect and think about these interactions, Rob, it's probably a case of ignoring my intuition. Where, you know, through a number of reasons, compromising integrity, my own values or, or boundaries, and it's the universe's gentle way of saying, ah, 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 You're like, stay true, mofo. And, and, and I would agree with you as well, Rob. There's no way that I can ever, no matter how jaded I might seem, and this is unusual for me, like I'm normally pretty upbeat and pretty, but it's like when it impacts you and your family and it's around Thanksgiving, Christmas time, and it's like, you, it's, it's the fact that you don't, that innocence of trust is gone. Yeah. It's only, it can only happen a number of times before you realize that, like, you've got to play hardball. And I, yeah. not being taken advantage of, or not allowing myself to be taken advantage of, is something that I'm getting better and better at. Yeah. No, it's, re- it's not so much fun when you have to play that hardball. But I know in business, it is about, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, whatever. And it's not a pleasant place if you really have the innocence of a child and want to live in a life with a perception, you know, like the, the innocence of, of, of a child. And there's beauty in that, of course, at the same time, when you enter certain arenas, uh, we got to put on our big boy pants and realize, and, you know, this is something I'm still learning because it's so distasteful and disgusting to me, you know, and I watch, you know, friends that are very good in the business world, even those that are very skilled can often be taken advantage of and, and deceived. And you're like, Whoa, how did that, how did he get played? Right. How did he fall for that? And yet, to some degree, the desire for more stuff, a materialistic worldview, makes us vulnerable. You know, are we seeking first the kingdom of, of God? Or are we seeking first material comfort? And as I said, the spiritual uh, guidance that I seek uh, keeps me out of some of that mess, but it's not like I've never been through those things. I have, and it, it made me ever more cautious at the same point. But then again, what do I value? What do I really want? And, and knowing that I'll be cared for and that I am cared for because I put the spiritual uh, first, you know, that it, it changes the ability or limits the ability to be deceived because I'm not being enticed by things that are, that are already set in deception. And this is a tough one, uh, Laban, because, again, we, we want to live a good life. We want to live a pleasant life. We want to have material comforts. But I look at my life in my lifetime and I'm thinking, well, we've, we've had it pretty good. Even if we haven't been super wealthy or, or considered wealthy by certain standards, we haven't wanted for much. And, and we, you know, lived as, as the kings and queens and emperors of old in a modern context with, um, you know, magically food appears in the grocery store every day. We didn't have to grow that food. We didn't have to toil in, in, the, uh, in the, the, you know, the fields. We didn't have, to, uh, you know, all the things we didn't have to do. And it just, we're, we're alive. We're doing well. We don't have to think about it. And that's an anomaly in the history of humanity, other than the kings and queens who had slaves or basically servants and uh, wanted for nothing because they controlled everything. And yet most of us experienced a life like that and didn't realize it because this is the life we knew from the day we were born. True, we've had difficulties, all of us had, but they weren't on the scale of those at previous, you know, previous times in, in history where, you know, we yeah. You didn't know if you're going to live through the day sometimes, much less find out where you're going to get your meal or your shelter or, you know, anything like that. So we are perhaps to learn and turn back towards the divine. So we recognize that even our material comforts are, are met because we put our faith and, and place our trust there, not in man. 
and then be guided to those who have integrity, of course, even within a corrupt system, perhaps, or as many are describing, trying to create a parallel system that doesn't rely on a system that is corrupt from the word go. I hear a lot from a lot of people trying to do that now, uh, economically, healthcare, different, different systems saying, you know what, we can't reform this system. It's too bad. It's too broken. Let's just set up our own. And, you know, that's what we talk about using different forms of money as well in exchange that have more integrity and more true value, not debt as a basis to move forward. There's a cartoon that I've been enjoying with Anna, my beautiful wife, called Primal. It's an adult cartoon. I think it might be on HBO Max, but uh, you should check it out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very interesting, it's across a couple of different series, but it sort of starts out like uh, during the dinosaur age, right? Like mm-hmm. in this context. And this guy, in the very first episode, his, his wife and two children are eaten by a dinosaur in front of him and he loses everything and the the cartoon like every episode is like 20 minutes long every single episode this guy is fighting for his life and he ends up becoming friends with this other dinosaur who um whose children ate his children it's this weird thing and i and it's you know even though it's an entertaining cartoon it's it's like a real interesting look on gratitude because this guy is getting his ass handed to him every single day. Like he's, it's life and death of being attacked by pterodactyls and all this kind of stuff, right? And it's, you're right. It's because I'm, I'm in this weird world, Rob, where I'm, I, I'm, and I'm very blessed. My God, you know, I'm blessed to call you guys friends and and uh, to have stayed in your home for a couple of months and you know be looked after both Anna and I, and and I'm friends with people that are very successful financially in the business and the marketing space and and other people that are spiritual and there's like i've got these like conflicts around being able to remain in that place of gratitude that you're talking about and not the the materialistic side of things but i also think about the impact that i can that i know that i can have on the world with material objects as well Mm, with financial things so it's a weird sort of balancing act for me does that resonate with you at all yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's such a challenge because we, we live in a material world, right? And we have to uh, supply the materials necessary to sustain life and maybe even for some enjoy life for, you know, the things that it can also buy. Um, but look at what we are doing. I say we, in a sense, if we look around and say, what is the, you know, one of the most uh, rapidly rising trending terms in in social media or in search engines it's died suddenly died suddenly I'm like well, where did that come about that was never part of our upbringing it was not a thing that you would search died suddenly and now it's like whoa and people have done things in terms of embracing experimental injections simply because they wanted to be able to um, travel um, be able to go to a grocery store or a play or a movie to be able to go out amongst the people. They said, in order to do that, you have to get this shot, this injection that was not very well tested. In fact, I covered on the show yesterday, my show, uh, the fact that the FDA's oversight of all these clinical trials, which are still ongoing for these COVID jabs are completely and woefully inadequate. Like the, if they, if they inspected 10% of the trial sites, that was big time news, right? 10%. They didn't even ins- oversee it. So you think, well, the FDA is looking out and protecting us here in America. Uh, so they would not put a shot out that would be harmful. Would, of course, it's safe and effective as we hear the mantra. And yet people were so willing simply for material comfort, benefit, whatever, to risk death just to be able to go out to a restaurant or to travel to a place they want to travel or to have a, a job that they thought, you know, was the only way they could sustain themselves. And arguably, yeah, well, it's a material thing. I work, they pay me and I can, you know, put a roof over my head. At the same time, they said, you have to risk death in order to come to work for me and I'll pay you with evidences of debt. How far have we descended from true value in exchange that we're willing to say, okay, yeah, just inject that. Maybe I'll live. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll have a few months. I, it, it's astonishing to me, uh, but this is part of my journey and trying to, you know, talk about utilizing my voice to awaken people if they're ready for it, to recognize the system is so corrupt that they'd be willing to say, in order for you to participate in the system, you have to risk death by an injection that we say you must have. And many people want, well, sure, I'll take the shot just so I can keep doing what I enjoy doing. 
And is it worth it risking death or died suddenly for that? And I, and I say that, and I bring this up because it's, it, you know, what is our value system? Not only do we have a system of government and medicine and media and corporate uh, corporatocracy saying in order to work, you have to take an experimental injection that can alter your DNA protein synthesis forever. Maybe you won't live. Um, but people are going, oh, yeah, yeah, that system is so worth it. I'll, I'll risk that. I, dude, we have strayed far from what's really important and what really guides us and really helps us sustain life in order for the chasing of material goods and comforts. Uh, so it's a challenging time to see this and witness this, and it's saddening too and maddening. At the same time, it's designed to wake us up to say, what is our, what really is important? What do we really value? And would we require somebody to take an experimental uh, injection or play a game of proverbial Russian roulette in order to participate, you know, in terms of interacting with you or me? I mean, we would never do that. That's horrible. And it's become an accepted practice. And in other words, to rebel against it, there are still people that are upset with me speaking out against that system. How dare you? It's like, wow, we, we got a value system that's pretty messed up. And we got to navigate that to find people to interact with economically. And there's the <laughs> the other moral dilemma of like, mm-hmm. you know, because you've been you've put your voice out there for a long time, Rob. You've been on the receiving end of lots of uh, vitriol and being, you know, taken off YouTube and Spotify and big big places where you could have an impact. It's like I think about these things. This is the shadow side that we might have spoken about previously. Mm-hmm. It's like. I get you get to the point where you get so dejected from trying to operate from a place of service, you get slapped in the face, and it's just like, yeah. you know what? Um, I'm just going to let you die. I'm just going to let you find out the hard way, or I'm going to let you suffer immeasurably because you don't want the help. Yeah. How how do you how do you handle the the dark side? Mm-hmm. Well, God loves me enough to allow me to screw up, to learn the things I need to learn to come back to Him. That's my perception of it. And so I can look back and, and curse the abandonment that I felt or, you know, the ailments and illnesses I suffered for the first 19 years of my life before I said, no, no more. I'm not going to subject myself to poison. You know, that doctor say we can, I'm a doctor. I have a license and a degree and I can poison you back to health. Like at one point you wake up and go, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Why would I want to do that? And you don't know because the system has been so set up as it is. We grow up in it. We don't think about it. This is just the way it is until it becomes so uncomfortable that you decide to choose a different path. And that's the, the beauty and the love that uh, God has for us to allow us to make these horrible choices resulting in untold suffering. At the same time, you know, we have compassion, you have compassion, and you want to help people. But can you help, and w- is it a good idea to help people that don't want your help? As you pointed out, well, I'll just let you suffer. It's like that you could say it, no, I'm vindictive and angry that you, you should suffer versus Look, this is a choice you've made, and I have to love you a, a, enough to allow you to go through it so you can come back in full consciousness of, you know, the consequences of the decisions you made. This is the experience you had so that you're indelibly changed for the better forever. Whereas if I take away your suffering before you're ready, what have you learned? Much like when I prayed to God for even a lightning bolt from the sky to heal me after 19 years of chronic disease. And I, if I had gotten that quote unquote gift I was requesting, I would learn nothing. I could tell people, you know, if I had a show, it wouldn't succeed more than a day because then I'd say, pray for lightning. Maybe you'll get struck and you'll be healed miraculously. As opposed to what happened was I was allowed to suffer even more and learn uh, spiritual lessons, deep, deep spiritual communication uh, lessons. So that some years later, when I encountered a homeopathic doctor, I wouldn't reject him outright because it, it didn't fit the definition of everything I grew up with and was programmed to believe before that, right? Homeopathy, that's quackery. That's nonsense. That's not real. On and on it goes because we've been programmed by so many forces that want us to remain enslaved and uh, controlled by those who profit from our fear and our disease, etc. And so waking up when I did, I still had to process and get grounded in the communication we talk about, learning of the hue and other things that I did, so that when I was uh, given the gift for the next step of my journey, to learn the healing I truly desired since I was a toddler or before, but in a different way than I expected it, then I would be willing to go through all the hard work and hardship 
10 plus years of intense training. You know, it's like, well, when does this training end? It, it actually never ends, but at a certain point, you know, you've toiled in obscurity for decades and then you become an overnight sensation and no one sees all that you did and went through. I mean, that's why, you know, you wrote your book to give people some insight on the things you went through so that they know, Hey, <clears throat> kids got some street cred over there. Look what he did, what he went through. And yet most people don't see that or are unable to read that. But as we're going through it, <clears throat> we'll often ask, well, when, when, when can I finally reap the rewards? And yet the rewards are being reaped the moment you recognize the, the, the suffering the traumas that you've been through are gifts in real time. And when you're going through them, you recognize it and you're grateful for it. You're closing the loop, that karmic loop from a distance of I'm a victim. I have no idea the cause and effect relationship to I see it now. Or even if I don't see it in the moment, I recognize I've been through this so many times that this is happening for me and not to me. That you're just looking for, you know, maybe understanding the causal relationship to the gift that you, it's not a pleasant gift, but you're saying, why is this happening? And I'm not cursing God because it's happening. I'm thinking, thank you, God, because this is clearly something that is opening me up to more of your love, for instance, more of your guidance and more of the, you know, the things that I'm here that I've committed to before I got here to do while I was here. And at any point we have the freedom to make a choice to say, you know what, that thing I said, I was going to, I don't want to do that. And of course, then enjoy the consequences or, or be miserable in the consequences of that choice as well. But all of those things are gifts that we learn here better than anywhere else in the planet's from the universes of God or creation. And then you begin to be grateful for even those, you know, those moments of like you said, Laban, man, I don't want to be cynical about everybody that I'm interacting with, but they're not, you know, rising to the occasion. Then we question, well, what is our, you know, prime motivator? What is, what is it, what is causing me to interact with these folks? And it's a gift, every one of these cursed events to get to that next step, to that next level that you super, you know, you, you go beyond it at the same time, we're here still interacting with it, but, and I know you, Laban, you, you know, you want to be that living example for what you believe and what you've learned. And yet you're being thrown as we all are. Some would say obstacles. And then some say, well, you know, these are not obstacles. These are technically stepping stones to where I've said to God, I want to go. And all of these things are happening for me so that I can get there. And we think, well, that time frame is wrong. It should be now. <laughs> and it's like, I've, I'm old enough to know it. You know, it's not in my time. God's time, but you know, I will continue to work and commit, you know, to what I've, I've, I've said it's my desire. And, uh, I don't know what the time frame is. That's why, you know, people that predict things, even the collapse of the economics and the society that we're all in, it's like, I think we're in the middle of it, but at the same time, it's like, how is it even possible it exists one more day? Well, the power of belief is so, so amazingly powerful that our collective beliefs added to one and, uh, and, and our belief in a system that even if we don't like it, it's still everybody's believing in it. It, it, it. it has a power to sustain itself even in its artifice. And we're witnessing that until more people go, no, I don't want to participate. I don't want to participate. Don't. And suddenly then it collapses of its own weight. And then, you know, where are you in a system that you've invested in that you know is so corrupt? It's like, I've succeeded in that. And then pff, that's gone too. So the illusion was there. And, and I'm trying to say, we can see this. We've been through this probably many times before, but for whatever reason, we need to experience it again to mark it indelibly into our DNA, if you want to say it that way, so that we create a system that really fulfills us and, and doesn't fall short of that. That's again, I mean, I think about that goal and desire and the experiences I've had uh, that changed what I believed about life itself over time and the system that we're operating in. So here you got me rolling this morning. It's ridiculous. You're warming up those vocal cords for your show later on today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful, powerful, poignant point, and one that I don't have the answer for. But I, you know, as you were sharing that, I realised that there was for the six incidents of being let down, right? For whatever you want to call it, there was ten x wonderful, amazing things that happened in my life. I. You know, as someone uh, that I, I don't really know that well at all, but I, I had a, an impact on him and he, he created something and then posted a 10 minute monologue dedicating the monologue on social media, like a public acknowledgement of thanking me, right? Like, and, and although that didn't translate into any monetary thing, it was like, how many people get to say that? And this isn't a this isn't a rarity. This isn't like a once in a lifetime. This shit happens all the time, right? 
and and I, I need to be grateful for that, and I am grateful for that, and and now I feel better about the whole thing as well. Mm. Um, I was conscious of not not having a super long live, um, and I'm, but I'm glad we've spoken about what we've spoken about. But for people that that want to find more about you and the, the amazing, because you, it's not just the show that you've got as well. You're being you're heavily involved with lots of amazing events. The medical health freedom, the, the Red Pill Expo. Number what? What do you got going on at the moment that you can share with people that they can tune in? Well, we, we, I say I survived like six or seven weeks of intense uh, travel, being away from home more than I uh, I was at home with these events you mentioned, and a number of them, including you mentioned the Red Pill Expo, which is phenomenal. If you guys ever get to go to one, the next one I think they're scheduled for early June of 2023. We don't know where yet, uh, but you can get tickets for it at the 2022 prices they told me before who knows what inflation is going to do and even if you find you can't make it because it's a city you can't get to they'll refund it but i'm just thinking of the good people that are trying to bring people together that are making change not based on fear but because they have a genuine desire to you know create the powers of co-creation they've been given something wonderful and you know i've been to so many events where people are aware of Something's gone horribly awry. It's wrong. There's just something not right about it. Yet they're still operating in fear. And and it, and they're not yet at the place of that co-creation, you know, not because they're afraid, but because, hey, you know what? I've been given these powers of co-creation. Why aren't I using them for something amazing as opposed to operating because I'm afraid of what's happening now? Uh, so some of these events that were, you know, are occurring or I'm seeing a transition to that, which is nice. You know, as much as people have been living in fear for a, for a while and more intensely under the COVID crazy year and all the things that they're trying, seemingly promising that they're going to deliver, you know, recent information from the G20 and other things are telling us, well, we're not giving up on vaccine passports. Yeah, we want digital identifications, all of these things to distance you from your divinity. We want to make you an artificial creation of the state or a corporate uh, reality where you are, again, a slave to a system that you will never truly get ahead on. Even those that are super wealthy, they have this vacuous place in their heart. They're not fulfilled. And, you know, they keep going, they keep going, keep going. They're like, oh, why aren't they happy? Um, because the artifice is set up to keep you always unhappy, always striving for something more that they know you can never have in that system, in their system. So these events that I attend, uh, whether they're fully engaged consciously in that, I see more people coming to them. And um, there are uh, events in the new year in Orlando. We've got a, a health event that my friends, Dr. Terry and Stu Warner are hosting that they had to reschedule because of the hurricane in Florida in October. Uh, that's coming up. And um, gosh, if you just come to robertscottbell.com, there's an upcoming events tab on my website, or you can sign up for the newsletter, you know, at robertscottbell.com. Or if you have a U.S. or Canadian number, you can text uh, my initials RSB. Uh, to 22828. So the number 22828, take your phone out and go 22828. I'm going to text that number, text RSB, and you'll be prompted right away to enter your email and you'll be plugged into all that we do, including the things that I utilize and recommend for health and healing that uh, I think are, well, they're not getting much play in the mainstream media other than be denigrated by those who don't want you to stop profiting, you know, big pharma and big medicine and all of that to keep you in a spiral of disease management. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on, Laban, and hopefully we can connect at uh, one or many of those events. Plus, we've done a few events together, too, which is was a lot of fun to watch you in action with people at those events. It's like they're enamored with you. You know, <laughs> it's like you start talking, you've got this audience around you. It's like and you're really trying to help them and inspire them, which I love about you and 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 your, your lovely wife, who who uh, we we long to have more meals with again because we've had so much fun together. Uh, so, Anna, we, we send love and hugs to you as well uh, and hopefully get together, if not down where you are, uh, somewhere now that we can travel again, despite all of the obstacles to that. Well, Rob, we graciously receive and accept your wonderful kind words. And anytime I ever feel down and out about the world, I just think about the video footage of your daughter who's 17, firing a 50 caliber um, <laughs> rifle by holding it in the air by herself and firing it off, knowing that um, we've got people like you guys looking after us. So we're very blessed. Thanks for coming on today. We'll bring you back on again very, very soon. Check them out, robertscottbell.com, and stay tuned for another interesting live. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? 
Uh, and this will be available for, for recording on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. See you later, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Lloyd.